Our next speaker, Corey Clothier, is the lead for IoT mobility and automated vehicles at Local Motors. Corey co-developed the U.S. Army program, AREBO, which stands for Applied Robotics for Installation and Base Operations, which was a White House-supported Global Cities Challenge program. Corey was honored to present the AREBO program at the White House in 2014. Corey joined Local Motors this year to continue to lead smart and automated vehicle development, which are enabled by IoT. Today, Corey will be talking about next generation vehicles. Please welcome Corey Clothier. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to take you on a little journey. My vision and our team's vision for next generation of automobiles and, uh, and kind of an IoT mobility vision. So I'm going to cover a lot, and I ho hopefully this will all make sense in the end. So as Terry said, I worked with the Department of Defense for about seven years in their ground robotics technology group, and I was a strategist helping to figure out what can we do with robotics. And, and through that, I met this this gentleman named Jay Rogers from Local Motors. And he shared his vision, and we're coming together to build what we think is a very disruptive model and a future model for technology and mobility innovation. So a quick outline, can't help it. I'm an engineer. Um, I was a pilot, so I'm just used to these checklists. Just to keep us on track, this is what I think an outline for future mobility could look like. And I'll share with you how we believe we're deploying this and we're moving forward along this path. So obviously, crowd design, that's local motors. They do everything through crowd-based challenges. They have a community of 40 to 50,000 automotive engineers and designers working together to build the next concept of vehicles. And they're purpose-built. We can build very fast through direct digital manufacturing using local supply and demand with our micro factories. Our goal is to set up 100 micro factories in the next 10 to 12 years around the, around the world. And everything we do is very open. So it's open design, open iteration. And using the Internet of Things, it's going to become faster, smarter, and we'll be able to design these things openly for the world. Obviously, that kind of spin, spins us into continuous improvement, shared, connected, and smart. So let me get, get on with the story here. So as I mentioned, Jay Rogers, that's the guy looking at his cell phone there, created the first internet-built car, and that's called our Rally Fighter. He also was the first one to do a 3D printed car, which is there on the screen, the Strati. Pretty amazing car. And Jay has this vision to create automobiles and get them into the marketplace much, much faster than conventional means. Five times faster and 100%, or 100 times less cost. So how he does this is through a co-creation model. So this is kind of where we start the Internet of Things connection. Is, as I mentioned before, we have 40 to 50,000 automotive designers and engineers working together on the new automotive designs. And this could be from designing an entire car, or just designing the suspension, or designing interior features, because it remains open and innovative throughout the process. And then we build them locally. We do prototyping, testing, all in the local markets to serve, to serve that local market and the demand there. In our global community, so essentially they design, build, and, and then help us market, but they, they do it in an extremely fast way. We can take a design concept and we can build a car in about four months. So, and as I mentioned before, this, these are kind of the stats, five times faster, 100, 100 times less cost. So let's see if we actually accomplish this. If I can start the video here. So as we say, this car, car was built by the internet. So 
ground and out, out the door into the marketplace. And it looks like fun, right? So it's a high performance, essentially a race car, off-road race car, but it is street legal. And as I mentioned, it was designed through the crowd. And then what's pretty fascinating about the design for this is Jay was trying to think of how can we get this out on the road faster? And it's essentially a kit car. So if you buy this car, you don't just get to pick it up from the showroom. You come to our factory and you help us build it, which is, which is a lot of fun. And it builds more of a community within the owners themselves because they get to know our, our builders and our designers and they get their hands dirty building their own car. And so far, people really love it. So that's our first one. And this is, this is the next challenge that we um, took on. So as I was working for the Department of Defense, I was also on a, a sister team to this project. The Department of Defense put out a challenge. They typically will take about 10 years, and it could, it could be up to $100 million to create a new vehicle for the Department of Defense in the, in the United States. So their challenge was, you know, what can we do that's innovative and can we do it faster? So I was on a team that unfortunately lost to Jay and our challenge was about two years, and I think our budget was in the three to five million dollar range. Jay created this car in under five months and under a million dollars. I think they came in at about a half a million dollars and four and a half months, which was pretty amazing. And then we move on to other products. So we can, we, as I said, we can design vehicles really fast, and here are some of our other products. Keep your eye on that vehicle, that little tricycle on the bottom right hand corner, because I'm going to talk about that later. And we'll be talking a little bit more about the Internet of Things connections. So going through our checklist, we're crowd designed, we're purpose built. Let's skip over direct digital manufacturing and jump into local supply and service real quick. So we do this through micro factories, as I mentioned. Um, a micro factory is still about 40,000 square feet for those of us that aren't on the metric system, um, about 100 employees, and it's locally demand driven. And what we're doing with our micro factories, we're setting them up around the world, like I mentioned. Our goal is 100 in about the next 10 to 12 years. Our first ones are in the, the one with all the vehicles out in front that is our current headquarters in Phoenix, Arizona. The one that's being built is Knoxville, Tennessee. That is really going to be our flagship building by the end of this year. And then also we have Las Vegas, where in Vegas it's always a party, right? But then you also see coming soon, we have all of these other, via, other um, sites coming on board. So now, let's make the jump back over to IoT again. So if we work, we're starting to work with a partner, and they're going to make our factory smart using IoT technologies. And you can, you can understand pretty simply how that could work within the factory itself. But as we start to build this network of factories around the world, you can also see how IoT is going to connect those factories and can start to dictate supply uh, based on our demand and what our capabilities are at that specific factory. And we can even go as far as if we need to rush a factory into a new location, we can do that as well. So this is our Mobi factory. It's currently set up in the Washington, D.C. area. But this gives us the capabilities to, to build something right now. And that's going to take us to the direct digital manufacturing. So we started direct digital manufacturing or 3D printing cars late in 2014 was our first one. And I'll show you what that looks like. We printed a car. So we did this on the show floor of IMTS, and then we re repeated it at the North American Auto Show in Detroit in January. So this car, again, was built through our community of online designers. And it took about 44 hours to print and a couple hours to assemble. Very simple car, not many moving parts, but it is an electric vehicle that's ready to be driven. Um, and it was pretty, pretty exciting when you can hit print on the first day of the show and then drive the vehicle away a few days later. So we continue to evolve. We're continuing to look at new designs, and that's kind of where I came in. I joined the company to lead our automated vehicle development, 
and now I'm kind of even broader based is as we're starting to work on the IoT solutions, I am also our IoT lead for the company. And as we look at these new solutions and we look at now, okay, we did a great prototype with this 3D printed car. Can we go further? And it comes in, this is our vehicle that we are actually going to be launching in next year in a neighborhood electric vehicle mode. And in 2017, it will be fully highway ready and certified. And we'll show you what this looks like. That's exciting, isn't it? I like the base, it's nice. So Kevin Lowe designed that. He's one of our designers in our community. He's been in there kind of a scrappy designer for a few years and he finally won a challenge. He's participated in quite a few of our challenges. So as you can see, that's really essentially the same car. It's gonna have the same drivetrain, it's gonna have the same chassis, but we'll be able to swap out the body panel, some of the interior components through the 3D printing model. Our goal with this is you can kind of imagine in the future that you can, order your car today and go pick it up tomorrow, and it will be, it's not on the lot, it's not in inventory, it will be built for you. So we believe in the next year we can get that 3D printing time down from 44 hours down to about 24 hours. We're gonna cut it in half in the next year, and then we'll see where we can go from there as the technology gets better and better. So, we have cars, you saw. We designed the cars through the internet, great. Now we need to start talking about how do we make these cars smart? How do we really connect them and start gathering data and really make these, this IoT mobility? So there's a vision that, that I have probably through movies since I was a kid. And it comes from um, a few different sources. One is one of my favorites, Johnny Cab from Total Recall. Pretty cool. You can tell that's pretty much 80s technology on that vehicle. But we get the idea. It's, it's a kind of Uber with a fake driver or a taxi with a robot driver. And then we actually go back in time and have a little bit better vision for Minority Re Report, the Tom Cruise movie. But you can start seeing how these vehicles are, are really connected in how they're IoT enabled in this movie. And of course, they're, aut they're autonomous, but they're all working together. Well, let's think, of, can we do this? Can we do it now? That's essentially what I was doing with the Department of Defense was we were deploying these types of technologies now on bases. And one of the current visions, this is a MIT city car vision, kind of curious, is, is this doable? Can we initiate this now? And I think we can. And it's really driven by the business case. And so the business case, there's been, there was a really interesting case study um, led by one of my friends, Larry Burns, who's really kind of an inspiration to all of this vision. He was a former um, vice president of research and development at General Motors. Now he's an independent consultant. But he is really pushing, um, pushing the vision forward. But the case study that was it's, um, published by Columbia, it essentially showed that autonomous vehicles in this kind of city car vision could be more cost effective today than taxi cabs in Manhattan. So these are essentially the stats is currently there's about 13,000 cabs. We could service the same population with about 9,000 automated vehicles. Wait time currently is five minutes. We could get it to about 30 seconds. And then the cost per mile for the operator is currently about $4 per mile, and we could get that down to about 50 cents. So the business case is there, so I'm ready to attack it, is essentially where, where we're going next. But to do that, these things have to be smart. They have to be shared. And we are a vehicle manufacturing company, and we don't have that intelligence yet. But 
some friends of ours do. So I'm not making any claims or commitments that we are working with IBM, but if we were going to work with an IoT company, IBM might be a great selection because they, they, their IoT mobility vision uh, really works with our vision as well. So we start thinking about the data. How do we get the data from the cars? We're going to need sensors. We're going to need sense internal, external, environmental. And with this, if you kind of put it back in the vision of our little company that makes 3D printed cars, it, you can kind of start to see. So this visual I pulled is actually from Google. So it's a visual of their LiDAR imaging. But that little Stratty prototype vehicle only had somewhere between, it had around 40 parts on it um, to make it a vehicle, which is pretty amazing. And it really lowers, the, you can see how it lowers the cost that way. But let's add some sensors and make this smart, connected, and autonomous. And let's put some brains in it. So most people are probably familiar with IBM's Watson, um, fascinating cognitive computing system. So what could we do with that? You know, if we put that brain in our car and let it start to learn, start to learn about driver habits, in, and then start learning about environmental habits, how do bikers typically respond? How do pedestrians respond? What happens when it rains and snows? What about the, and there was a fun story with, with our chief marketing officer, is we were starting to talk about this, a learning car, and she said she is just notorious for hitting curbs. She hit a curb a couple months ago and broke her axle, and it cost $7,000 to fix. Just curbs are her nemesis. So she wants to know, could this learning car keep her away from curbs? I think it can. So as we start to put the intelligence in the vehicle, again, this is IBM's vision, and I, I kind of like it, as we start to see the possibility of what this data can do, um, and what, what we can, how we can connect this data, not only in one car, but also in fleets of shared cars. Shared cars in a certain area that are working as a fleet, but how about globally? We, the, and the vehicles can all start to learn from each other. Now we have self-enabling vehicles and vehicle systems. So through the social network of IoT in these vehicles, we start to learn. And we, I think then the, the technology adaptation and advancement really becomes exponential when we have this kind of data and we have this kind of computing power in the car. So I'm pretty excited about it. I think this, then this is not, um, this isn't you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the future. This is really starting now, which is pretty exciting. So let's see how we did on my little checklist. So you know, I, I talked for about 15 minutes so far. And we kind of took the path of a car that was designed in the internet. It's purpose built. We use 3D printing, which that alone is probably a good enough story. But we start collect, collecting data. We start making these smart. We start making it an IoT mobility system. And now it's kind of blowing my mind. But we're going to do it. And we did a first test. And I'll let you know what we're doing now. So we hosted the Urban Mobility Challenge in Berlin for 2030. It's simply understanding where Berlin is going in the next um, 15 years or so. It, the population is going to increase. The infrastructure is pretty much going to stay the same. What can we do to help um, bring in this new technology to move people, move goods around the city better? And we hosted the challenge. It was finished in June through our design community again. And this is what we came up with, was one of our winners. We, had a, we picked five winners in different categories. But this was essentially the urban mobility winner. And it's the Berlino. And we've seen some shuttles out there. There's a company, Induct, another Navia, Robosoft has an EZ10. So there's, there's a few companies out there that are starting to test automated shuttles. And we, are going, we have one as well, or we will have one as well. So we're starting to design and build process on this. We're actually going to start testing early next year on the Berlino. And this will be a fully connected fleet vehicle. It's going to be connected to um, microgrids. It will be connected to the environment. And we'll see where it goes on how it's connected to pedestrians through IoT technologies and other uh, vehicles on the road. But it's a multi-purpose vehicle. It could also be used for logistics. So as we see this starting to take shape, 
we really can now start to see this entire ecosystem and environment taking shape through an Internet of Things vision. So one thing about this, this slide I wanted to mention is, again, I kind of touched on it before, is this is really great to have in kind of a local setting, is that the Internet of Things, will, all of this stuff will be connected to the fleet that's servicing the areas or the fleets and the different multimodal types of transportation that we'd be using. But I'm more excited about how we're going to connect this globally and how we'll learn from each other. So as we have Watson, I'm, I'm really <laughs> getting excited about this. Um, as we, you think about somebody in Barcelona driving, or not driving, but potentially riding in one of these autonomous vehicles, and they make a statement, or they, they tell Watson their preference, and then Watson's able to put that up in the cloud and share that and disseminate that throughout the entire network. Maybe it's speed, maybe it's, you know what, this stops too fast. I don't like how this handled the turn. But we start collecting data as well as it could just be sensor data. Um, and the entire ecosystem gets smarter and smarter as we move forward. And that, that's essentially our vision for the future of mobility using IoT. All right, thank you. So thank you, Corey. I think, personally, I'd like one of those cars. Uh, so can you get me one in four days? <laughs> Um, I wanted to, uh, I'm Lynn Canavan, and I'm Vice President of the Industrial Internet Consortium, and I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for coming with us, uh, thank you for coming to this inaugural event. Um, I think as you heard from this morning's keynotes, as well as all of the other content that you've heard over the last three days, um, you, you know, things are really coming together with IoT. I like to say that, you know, the train has left the station when we talk about the Industrial Internet. We're not quite on the, the high speed rail, but we're getting there. Uh, and thank you for taking that journey. There's still a lot of great content this afternoon. The um, 1130 uh, sessions are getting started a few minutes late. Uh, but do you know, do know that there are uh, several great sessions to come this afternoon. So thank you again for coming. And we hope to see you here next year. This event will be held October 25th through the 27th. Thank you.